Um, now, over the last uh, four weeks, we have been talking about the voice of the shepherd being heard uh, by believers in Christ. How many of you remember that? Huh. Well, hopefully you do. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the instrument by which that voice is communicated. So we're not uh, precisely talking about John chapter 10 anymore. Uh, but we are talking about the means by which John chapter 10 is visited upon us, by the way by which it uh, uh, is able uh, to be heard by us, and that is the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be reading uh, a few texts out of the Gospel of John this morning, and uh, then we'll uh, dig into these things. Uh, John chapter 14, I'm going to start reading with verse number 16. And uh, I'll read just a couple of verses there, and then I'll move on uh, to the next uh, couple of spots that we go to. Uh, this is from the New International Version of the Bible, and this is what it says there. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him. For he lives with you, and he will be in you. And then I'm going to skip down to verse number 26, and uh, there I'll read this. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And then into John chapter 16, are you still with me? Uh, verse number 13, I'll start with there. When He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me because it is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is Mine, that is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word. Now hopefully uh, even in just a, a cursory uh, hearing like, uh, like you've just had as we went through the text, you'll see that in these passages uh, it's very clearly taught in Scripture that the, the way that the voice of Jesus is communicated to believers is through the Holy Spirit. Um, now that may not have been true when Jesus was walking amongst them, but it certainly is true since Jesus went to the cross, went to the grave, came out of the grave, and ascended back into heaven. Um, ever since Jesus left, in a matter of speaking, the Holy Spirit has been the definite and the preferred co uh, communication channel for the voice of Jesus to come to his sheep. Now, we're going to take a, a look at this in, in some detail uh, this morning and, um, and, and try to understand that Jesus was speaking these things to his disciples right before his crucifixion. And the point that he was uh, uh, trying to accomplish in doing so uh, was to try to alleviate the anxiety uh, that, that uh, they would feel about the news that he was about to leave them. Now, he had been telling them that over and over again throughout his ministry with them, but for the most part, it kind of went right by them. Uh, they didn't understand, they didn't want to understand, I think, more than anything else. But now, it's about time for the rubber to meet the road. Jesus is about ready to do the very thing that he came into the earth to do, and what that meant, of course, is that the outcome of that would be death, firstly, uh, then his resurrection, which would have been uh, yip, yip, hooray, uh, but... You know, except for the fact that almost as soon as they had that bit of joy, then Jesus said, I, I have to go back to the Father. So um, this, uh, th this lesson, if you can call it that, that Jesus was giving them about the Holy Spirit was really something that, that um, he wanted uh, to uh, get across to them so that they would not be overwhelmed by the sense of loss. Uh, he tells them that though he's going to be leaving and going back to the Father, um, they're not going to be left alone. Now, you know, if you were in their place, imagine what might have been going through your mind as Jesus was saying, I'm leaving, but you're not going to be alone. It's like, well, who else beside the Messiah can be the Messiah to us? What else beside you 
can actually uh, accomplish, can actually do the things that, that you're doing with us and amongst us, um, I think they probably would have been a, a bit puzzled. But what Jesus says is that he's going to send them another advocate, it says in the NIV. Uh, advocate's an okay word, but I think that probably um, maybe not the best. Uh, the King James references the comforter here, also not the best word to use. Um, uh, as we'll see and as we'll talk about this morning, uh, getting a little ahead of myself here, but nonetheless it seems like a good time to say it, so I'll say it. Uh, it's really uh, could be most uh, properly translated as the word attorney. Um, if you can think about an attorney, what an attorney is to you, uh, that is what the Holy Spirit, Jesus is telling us in these passages, is going to be uh, to his disciples, to, to believers. Uh, and so uh, he's not going to leave them alone. He's going to leave them with uh, his representative. He's going to leave them with his attorney. He's going to leave them with his counselor. And uh, in leaving them with this counselor, uh, they have nothing to fear about being without Christ. Now, you know, for a sheep to be without their visible shepherd, that would be something that would cause anxiety. But if you have something that is going to accomplish all the functions, is going to accomplish all of the ministry, is going to accomplish all of the fellowship that Jesus did in person, then you actually don't lose anything. I mean, the fact of the matter is, us walking around with Jesus in the heavens interceding for us, us walking around... Uh, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, we haven't lost anything. You know, sometimes I think that we think the, uh, the Holy Spirit's kind of like the orphan sister of the, chair, of the uh, Trinity. And that's not true. If we have a conception that thinks that somehow or another it would be better to have Jesus walking around with us, then we just don't understand the Holy Spirit. If, if we would think somehow or another that if Jesus was here visibly, and we were hanging out with him, and we were chatting with him, and we were eating meals with him, and we were doing stuff with him. That would be so much better than what we have now. That's not true. And if we think along those lines, then hopefully if nothing else today, uh, today, maybe we can accomplish this. We can expand our vision and our understanding of the Holy Spirit to realize what an incredible gift the Holy Spirit is. What an incredible thing for Jesus to do to make sure that we would not be left alone without his comfort and counsel. And so that's what he was trying to get done with them. Um, and uh, <coughs> thankfully, as he was getting it done with them, it ended up being recorded in the Word of God, and now it can help us and benefit us in understanding all of this. We're going to look at these verses uh, with some detail this morning, uh, just looking at, at uh, the various places that are really essential to, to get a hold of. Uh, so that we understand as near as we can uh, very well uh, what's being said here. We start with verse number 16 in chapter 14, and uh, the first thing we're going to, to talk about is, is the statement that Jesus said the Father at the behest of Jesus is going to give. Um, now, what that means is that Jesus is already interceding with us at the very beginning of, of uh, his, uh, his life after the resurrection, He's, he's interceding for us with the Father that we could receive the Holy Spirit. He's, he's asking the Father uh, to give him uh, or to give us the Holy Spirit. Um, now, it, it, as he's asking that, um, the, it's an, an interesting word because the way that that word ask can be translated here, it really could be uh, translated along the line that, that Jesus will interrogate the Father. It, it's not that Jesus is asking for something that there's any doubt about. It's not that Jesus is asking something that has any kind of possibility that it's not going to happen or not going to be fulfilled. That's not it. He's not, he's not asking an open-ended question, in other words. He is, he is more or less um, you know, putting forth something we could say he's, he's really, in fact, making a, a demand. Not a demand in the sense that, that uh, there's any there's any dispute between the Father and the Son is about this, this, uh, this particular thing. That's not true at all. But, but it's, not that, it's not that it's iffy. Because sometimes when we, we think, when we see something like Jesus is going to ask the Father and the Father will give us the Holy Spirit, sometimes we, we read that kind of thing and in our human mind, especially the way we're reading English, right, we think, oh, there, there's, there's something about this 
that might not actually come to pass. There's something about this that is uncertain. And, you know, chase that from your mind. That's not at all what's being communicated here. Jesus <coughs> is stating something, I think, you know, rather ma matter-of-factly. Uh, the, the Father is going to give the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, uh, to us. And so the Father is, at the behest of Jesus, giving. Now, the word give here is uh, also a little bit interesting in the sense that, that uh, to understand the detail of that word and how it's used in, in various ways uh, as it's used in the Greek language, um, it really uh, uh, carries with it the thought that it's putting something in place. You know, when we think of gi giving, you know, we think of something that, you know, perhaps is similar to the gifts that we get from one another. Um, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to tell uh, tales out of school, but I, I'm sure that all of you have had the experience where you've gotten a gift from somebody and you're really appreciative of, of the thought, you're really appreciative that they wanted to give you that gift, but, but in terms of like practical reality, it's probably not something that necessarily has a lot to do with what you're trying to do. And so, as thankful as you are and as, as gracious as you try to be in receiving the gift, right, well, you, you, you get home, you put it on a shelf someplace, and it, it, it never sees the light of day again. Anyone want to say, amen, I know that experience. <laughs> sometimes, that sometimes that's the way a gift is. And, you know, I think that, that not understanding what is actually going on here, not understanding the mechanics of what's going on here, I think, I think Christians think that about the Holy Spirit. It's the gift that no one asked for. And so they go and put it on a shelf. It gathers dust and it's never, never seen or heard from again. And you know, that's just not what's going on here. We can't look at the Holy Spirit in that kind of a way. You know, there are, there are churches historically within the, the confines of Christianity that basically the only thing they ever mention the Holy Spirit about is just in passing as part of a formality. What a mistake that is. The Holy Spirit is, is not that, as, as I've said here in our introductory comments before we actually got into the text here, the Holy Spirit is what Jesus has given to us to give us the instrumentality of hearing his voice and fellowshipping with him, right? This is through the Holy Spirit. This is how it happens. It doesn't, it doesn't happen because you pretend it in your mind or make it up in your thoughts. It happens in reality because the Holy Spirit, which is the, 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 the means by which this is communicated to you, is put in place in your life. It's not just given to you to go stick on a shelf. That's not it at all. Jesus picks the place for it. And he picks the center of your very being for it. He doesn't pick some out-of-the-way place for it. He doesn't pick some place that's removed or somehow divorced from the, the real matter of who you are as a person. Right in the midst of who you are, right in the midst of your soul spot, God the Father places, he puts in place the Holy Spirit. And because he does, you can hear the voice of the shepherd. You can hear the voice of God. You can be blessed with an actual relationship with the Lord. Now, I, I, again, you know, when I use a word like relationship, I, I, get, I get sometimes a little wary of it because, you know, a lot of people will use that word in ways that are not helpful when we think about Christianity. So, for instance, um, you know, I have a certain relationship as I'm standing up here preaching to Route 222. It's over there and I'm over here. There's a relationship there. Now, that doesn't mean that I have anything to do with 222. It doesn't mean that 222 has anything to do with me, not as I'm standing here, right? But uh, there is some kind of a relationship. In other words, it's nothing more than a description that kind of puts two things somehow or another in a, in a prepositional connection. And some people think a relationship with God is like that. That all you have to do is go to church and you have a relationship with God because it's like me being related to 222. It, it just it just is a way of describing some kind of a, a prepositional connection, and that's not true. When we say that we are are people that have the Holy Spirit in us, that we are people that are are related to Christ as a result, what we're talking about is an actual relationship. The kind that you have with somebody that is close to you. A husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a, a friend. And I don't mean an acquaintance. I mean a good friend. 
What kind of relationship is that? It's a relationship in which there's interaction, which, in which there is, there is visitation, there is, there is a, a sense of, of camaraderie and companionship. This is what relationship is all about. And in this regard, when we talk about a relationship with God and the instrumentality of that relationship, the way that it gets communicated and expressed and empowered within us is this Holy Spirit that the Father has placed within us. This is how we are related to God. So, you know, I, I get a little wary, as I said, because I've seen too many times when, when folks talk about a relationship with, with Christ in the church world, and what they mean is, I said the sinner's prayer. Now, I don't necessarily have anything against sinner's prayer, but I tell you what, a sinner's prayer doesn't save you. God saves you. Specifically, Jesus Christ saves you. A sinner's prayer doesn't make you born again. The Holy Spirit does. Right? You know, a sinner's prayer might be some kind of a way in which we do shorthand and, and try to, uh, uh, you know, accomplish something in our understanding. But the fact of the matter is they didn't even exist until Charles Finney came around, and that was back in the early 1800s. And, and before then, were people saved? Yes, without ever uttering a sinner's prayer. What, what, how do you get saved? It's all about belief. If you believe in Christ, you are sheep to Christ. If you believe in Christ, then these promises that we're talking about here that he was making to his disciples, they are your promises. This is how it gets done. When you actually, in your heart, believe in Jesus Christ, God puts the Holy Spirit inside of you, right into the depth of your soul, and because he does, you can have a relationship with God. This is what that is all about. Now, he, in talking about, back to verse number 16, uh, and 17, um, in, in talking about this, describing it, Jesus said that, that the Father is going to give them another counselor, another advocate, another um, comforter, uh, however you want to translate paraclete in English. Um, uh, Jesus is going to give them another one. Now, in saying that he's going to give them another one, what, what's he, uh, what he's saying is just this, is that he's giving them uh, another one who's like him, but different. And you think about why that's necessary. You can think about it in the physical realm. They're not going to have somebody anymore who has a warm flesh and body blood or a body in front of them. And, you know, Jesus they could touch. They could, uh, they could sense. They could hear him with their physical ears, right? They could, um, you know, if they were walking in a long height, they could smell him. Uh, what, Jesus was, was in that way. But when he says, I'm going to give you, or when the Father is going to give you another uh, counselor, what he's saying is it's going to be somebody like me but different. Um, I, I, I don't know that if it's much help, but I, I think that it's really important to understand that the Holy Spirit is not Jesus Christ any more than the Heavenly Father is Jesus Christ. Essentially, you know, what makes them God is the same as, you know, in, in each and every one. Uh, what makes the Father God is also what makes Jesus Christ God. And it's also what makes the Holy Spirit God. But they're not the same thing. Uh, the Holy Spirit is another. There's a distinction there. And that distinction, of course, is very blessed for us because it means that the Holy Spirit, not being limited to a flesh and body body like Jesus was, is actually able to come right inside our very being. Right inside our very being and communicate all of the desires and wishes of the Godhead uh, to us in a very intimate kind of a way. Now this word advocate, um, I've left out already uh, that, uh, that uh, the Greek word there is in this particular case is the parakletos uh, or tos, um, and it means attorney. And what's, what's the job of an attorney? Well, believe it or not, a, an attorney is someone who, in the case of spiritual matters, is someone who would represent you to God and someone who would represent God to you. Um, he's, the, he's the one who you know, makes the, the bridge of communication as you will. And so the, the, the uh, para uh, kaletos, or toss, 
can't even ever get that, that short o, o, o sound there. It's Omicron, not Omega. Um, but uh, that, uh, that one who is representing God to you and that is representing you to God is, is the one who is, is making the, the, the bridge possible in, in a, the experience relationship. So without the Holy Spirit, can you be related to God? And the answer is no. You might know about God. You might have experienced some kind of touch or some kind of intervention or some kind of action from God. But it is impossible to know God apart from the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit inside of you for that for that representation, for that communication, for that uh, for that uh, uh, manifestation. You have to have the Holy Spirit for that to happen. Um, sometimes you'll be absolutely amazed at how dumbfounded they seem to be. You're talking about things to them that are spiritually apprised. You're talking about things to them that that without the Spirit within them, they are incapable of understanding. And, and to tell you the honest to God truth, if the Holy Spirit isn't accompanying any talk that you have about Christ, uh, working a, a, a supernatural conviction on the person that you're talking to, it's going to just buzz right by them without touching them. It's not even going to so, so much as light its feet. It's just going to go whoosh right on by. See, we just don't, we don't have any way to connect to, understand. We don't have any way to have God represented to us or us represented to God apart from the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is this advocate, is this uh, counselor that, uh, that we need. And, and he intercedes for us. Now we know that Jesus is interceding for us, but the Holy Spirit's interceding for us as well. And uh, from within inside of us, that's an incredible thing. At some point in time, of course, we'll talk about one of the particular uh, nuances of that intercession. It's something called speaking in tongues. But uh, quite apart from that, it's not that the Holy Spirit is limited to that aspect of intercession alone. Uh, he's not. He's capable of having all of his faculties, all of his care, all of his concern, all of his vision and commitment. And I tell you what, the commitment of God to make us new creatures, that commitment's in the Holy Spirit. And the love of Christ, which died for us and rose from the dead for us, that's in the Holy Spirit, right? Everything that's in God toward us for our good, for our redemption, for our transformation, that's in the Holy Spirit. He feels the same way about us in all of those areas. And he is, he is interceding. He is uh, uh, just moving within our very souls. Uh, to, to make a, uh, a plea always under the Heavenly Father to bless these vessels that we are. And I tell you what, I'm so sure glad that he's interceding for me. Um, now, uh, 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 Jesus uh, furthermore says that um, this is uh, forever. The, the actual phrase that he uses is until the end of the age. Now, that's a good thing to, to, to remember because as Jesus was speaking this, He's speaking to his disciples, and we could say that a lot of his specific statements were most directed to those apostles that were with him in, in the place where he was talking. When we talk about us, you know, uh, having all of this, this stuff uh, affecting our lives, it, it's because of the model that, that we have with the apostles and the other things that are said throughout the, the New Testament scriptures that tell us these very things are for us. It wasn't just for them as as unique disciples, but in a sense, they were model disciples, and, and the model being fulfilled in them is true of everything that follows them. We can say they were prototypical in that respect. Everything that was true of their experience with the Holy Spirit is meant to be true of anybody who meets the category, being a believer, having Christ, having the same kind of experience. Um, why is, why is this, this till the end of the age? Well, when he's speaking to the disciples here, uh, does Jesus know that at the end of the age is going to be some, you know, 2,000 or more years later? I would say that he, he at least had an inkling, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine Jesus being completely and utterly in the dark. He wasn't, right? Now, I know that he said he doesn't know the day of his return, but he certainly, in all of his prophesying to them, whether you're looking in Matthew chapter 24 or, or looking in Luke chapter 21 or, or in, in the Gospel of Mark, what, you know, when you look at it, you can see that Jesus had a long-range vision in mind. Here we see the same thing because he uses the word to the end of the age. 
Now I know, you know, it says forever uh, in the NIV. Other translations will use something similar. But the, the exact phrase that's used there in that place is till the end of the age. So what was Jesus saying? He was saying this is the way things are going to be done from here until the time I get back. From now until the time I come back. He hasn't come back yet, so we're still in that time. This is going to be how things get done. I will pray for the Holy Spirit to be put into you. The Holy Spirit will be placed into you. When the Holy Spirit is placed into you, the Holy Spirit will bring you into the encounter of relationship with the living God. And this is the way it's going to be from now until the time I get back. So right now, are we in that time? Yes, we are. Are you in that time as you're sitting in that pew where you're at? Yes, you are. You're in the time when this is the dynamic, this is the reality, this is the methodology that has been put in place for you to relate to your shepherd who is in heaven. Praise the name of the Lord. Um, so, uh, we have this. Now, this, this uh, until the end of the age, uh, this thing is something I, I think that, that uh, you know, in combination with a few other things that we can look at in Scripture, we're not going to, I'll just... Uh, fly by them really quickly right here and right now, uh, there are those who think that there's meant to be some kind of a drastic change in Holy Spirit dynamic after this, right? Here Jesus is talking to his disciples just before he goes to the cross. He says this dynamic that he's talking about is going to be in place from then until the time that he gets back. And then, you know, when we get into the book of Acts, chapter 1, and switching into chapter 2, we find that there was even, uh, you know, more left in this dynamic. And guess how that was talked about? It was talked about generationally, with the same sense of extension. He says this will be to you and your children and to all who are far off. Now, you know, what's the metric there? Generations. You your children, all who are far off. He wasn't talking about distance. He was talking about time. So you, your children, that's the next generation, and then all those who are far off, that's every generation that follows after as long as this age is in place. The age is in place until Jesus gets back. Why am I saying that? This dynamic of the Holy Spirit that begins with the Holy Spirit being put inside of us, put in place inside of us, that dynamic then being uh, continued with a pouring out of the Holy Spirit in fullness, that dynamic will last until the end of the age. There is no such thing as secessionism. They have to ignore virtually all of the scripture that's in the New Testament and say, well, that's not for any more today. That was for them, but it's not for today. I tell you what, if it's in the book, right, if it's the communication of Christ to us, and it is, then guess what? If you're his sheep, it's for you. Amen. It was then and it's still so. I'll tell you what, there's nothing worse than modern day Pharisees trying to keep the people of God from the things that God has for them. They won't enter in themselves and they keep God's people from entering in. If that's not the very definition of what's wrong with Phariseeism. I don't know what else is. Anyhow, I'll get off my soapbox and move on. Till the end of the age. Now, what's he going to do? Now, verse number 26 gives, gives us a few clues here. He says that he will instruct us. He will instruct us. How many of you need instruction in the ways of the Lord? Hey, we all do. I've got to tell you, you know, we've mentioned this already, but there's nothing about God that a human being can figure out. There's nothing about his, there's nothing about what's in his heart. There's nothing about the way in which he wants things to happen. There's nothing about the way in which he wants your life to happen. There's nothing about that that you can discover. You say, well, the Bible says that everybody's without excuse in Romans chapter 1 because they can look up and see the glory of God and, and pick out his attributes. Well, you know, you can look around nature and say, well, you know what, if there's a God, he must be powerful. If there's a God, he's got, he can't be affected by time like everything else is here. If there's a, you know, you can make those kinds of conclusions from looking at the creation and you can understand a lot about God. 
But can you understand what's in the heart of God toward you? No. Can you understand what God wants in your life? No. Can you understand how to walk in a way that's faithful and true to the Lord? No. You need the Holy Spirit. And we're all in the same boat. We would get nowhere if it was not for the provision made here in our verses that I've read to you today. If it wasn't for this provision of the Holy Spirit, none of us could pull this off. None of us would get anywhere. We would just be left to our fleshly selves. And the unfortunate reality is in the church world, too often we don't understand how important this dynamic of the Holy Spirit is. And so we do nothing but depend on ourselves. And it's why church people can be so hypocritical. It's why church people can be so nasty and mean. It's why church people can be so greedy and foul. Why do church people have the capacity of being all of those things? Well, because, you know, if you're not understanding that your only means of assessing not only who God is and what God is, but what it, how it is uh, being communicated to move through your life so that you can live a different way than you could on your own. If you don't understand this, then, then you, don't, you don't depend on it, you don't open up to it, you don't, you don't pay attention to the right things. And so you pay attention to the flesh rather than the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you the Bible teaches us this, that if your mind is on the flesh, you'll follow the flesh, you'll sin. If your mind is on the Spirit, you'll walk with God in spirit. This is just so simple, it's so, it's so straightforward and true, but it's so forgotten in the church world. What am I saying? I'm saying this dynamic that we have in the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for anything that's good and godly, for any understanding and for any practicality in the way that we actually walk. If you understand me, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. So he will instruct us. The Holy Spirit wants to Teach you how to walk. You know, teach you how to do something that you could not do on your own. Now, I know my father sometimes when I was a boy, and uh, I was uh, toting along, or he was toting me along with him and doing something. He used to always tell me, don't be rambunctious. Right? Because, you know, there's something inside of us that doesn't want to wait to be instructed. We just want to jump in and... You know, we want to just start swinging hammers or, you know, sawing saws or whatever else it might be. We would just want to jump in there and start doing stuff. We need instruction. Right? And, and we just have got to humble ourselves to understand that that's the truth and that the means by which we get that instruction is the Holy Spirit within us. So are you going to get instructed by God depending on your own intellect? No. You know, you can't study this book like it's a textbook in other words. What do you have to study this book like, like, like you're a person who's letting the Holy Spirit speak to you through the book? Um, he tells us that he will cause us to remember what Jesus said. Now this is where we really get into the, 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 uh, the, the nugget that is really the center of what we're talking about today, is it not? What did I say uh, at the, in my opening remarks about this? I said that, you know, in hearing the voice of the shepherd, what is the instrumentality? How, how does that manifest itself? How does that happen within us? Well, it happens through the Holy Spirit. And in this particular verse, we certainly see that very clearly taught. Uh, the Holy Spirit's job is to take the things that Jesus is saying and make them known to you, right? This is one of the, one of the Holy Spirit's jobs, maybe the chief job of the Holy Spirit within you is to take the words of Jesus and make them known to you. And here's the cool part about it is because learning takes repetition and part of uh, the reason for that, it takes us a while to remember. Right? I'm still trying to remember that our trash service has changed their pickup day. So I missed it this last Thursday night. And I woke up on Friday morning and I didn't hear the trash truck. I just... I was there sitting and, uh, you know, trying to get breakfast in and everything else. And I've been getting up relatively early ever since uh, my heart attack. Um, but um, I, I look at the clock and it says that it's like 14 after 6. I think, oh man, I forgot the trash. <laughs> and so I, I ran out, almost gave myself a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> 
I ran out and grabbed the trash cans and the, and the recycling bins and, and just rushed them out to the curbside. It's, you know, we don't have a curb, but you know, the roadside as quickly as I could. And uh, went back inside and thought, wow, because I hadn't heard them come in the prior 15 minutes or so. And I thought, ah, still time. The, tr the neighbor's trash cans were still out, so I thought I'm good to go. I wasn't good to go. Uh, they, he, he didn't come by, and so I missed it. And I think, man, how many times am I going to have to go through Fridays being trash day before it finally sticks in my brain? You know, I just wish that the Holy Spirit was in the trash. <laughs> because if he was, then he would make me remember. <laughs> One of the things the Holy Spirit does inside of us is he causes us to remember. And, and we are the kind of folks that would forget so quickly. We will forget all the things that we learned yesterday and the day before and at the last struggle, the last battle that we had. But we would forget it all if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit bringing back to our mind, bringing back to our remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us through our journeys, the things that we have learned from him. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit. He's inside of us to do that very thing. He's going to be the voice of Jesus to us. Praise the name of the Lord. And then we move into chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. Uh, we have a little bit of reiteration there. And Jesus said, you know, is repeating the thing. That's uh, repeating himself a little bit. That's not an unusual thing. I always repeat myself a lot when I'm preaching and teaching. And believe it or not, it, it's not because I'm stupid. It's, it's more or less purposeful. Because what I've discovered through life is how often or how much we do need to have things repeated. Um, I mean, even something like announcements, just, you know, a simple thing. I, I've discovered that if I don't announce something three weeks in a row here at church, nobody remembers. If it gets announced once, they definitely forget. If it gets announced twice, maybe 5% will remember. But somehow or another, if I say it three weeks in a row, it seems like then... A lot of people have heard it. They, 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 you know, it kind of like sticks. Uh, we just, you know, it's just the way we're made as human beings, right? Nothing, nothing is, uh, 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 nothing is sticking to us that well. We need sometimes to have things reiterated, to have things repeated. Uh, and Jesus does that right uh, in, in our verses out of chapter 16, verses 13 to 15, a little bit. Uh, he says that the Holy Spirit will lead us in all truth. You know, that's, that's kind of a saying the same thing that is said in, in slightly different terms uh, in, in chapter 14. Uh, but I like the way that it's said because uh, it says, um, uh, it uses a word here um, that, um, uh, well, let me read it to you again. Just so I don't mess this up. It's not that tricky, but it's tricky enough. When he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what's to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Okay? And that little four is the thing that I want to get to that, that we see all the important is. He will glorify me, right? Um, and he says uh, uh, that he will receive what he has made known to you. Now that that in that particular uh, verse there is, uh, is not that, it's actually the Greek word gar, and it means for, and it's talking about causation. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, in an argumentation that you'll see in the New Testament, particularly in the writings of Paul, uh, he'll use this word and it means that the thing that follows it comes about as a result of the thing that preceded it. Right, uh, this this is a cause and effect kind of thing. This this goes and then this this uh, comes thereafter. And so when he says uh, that um, that the, the that the Holy Spirit uh, is going to glorify Christ, what he's saying is that the reason that he does that, or the way that he does that, is that he makes known to us all of the things that that Christ is telling him. So Christ speaks. The Holy Spirit hears Christ. The Holy Spirit speaks to us the things that Christ spoke. Therefore, we hear from Christ. You know, this is the way this, this communication that we have with our shepherd occurs uh, as we are walking uh, in this particular life. Uh, the, uh, the, the reality is that, um, that uh, the whole reason 
that the Holy Spirit has given to us, uh, amongst all these other things, is that Jesus wants us to hear his voice. I mean, why, why did he, right on the verge of him disappearing from physical contact and life up close and personal with his disciples, why did he talk about the Holy Spirit? It's because he was trying to get across to them the very, the very things that him being in their life physically and personally, up close and personal, that was going to be picked up and carried by the Holy Spirit. The thing that brings the voice of Jesus to us is the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, you know, if you have the Holy Spirit, it, it goes, ergo, you know, if we want to make it a logical argument, if you, if you are, uh, have the Holy Spirit, or if you are a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, therefore, you hear the voice of the shepherd. That's the way that we can put that. And so it's really important to us that we understand just how important the Holy Spirit is in our sense of relationship with Christ. He, the whole point of having the Holy Spirit is not just to mark us. Now, the book of Ephesians says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that you're put into a hermetical seal in a bag. You know, they say this is hermetically sealed. You know, it's like this is, this is something you can't get into. It's germs can't get in there, air can't get. That's not what it's saying. So if you think that you're sealed in the Holy Spirit, it means that, that you're preserved like in a, in a Ziploc bag. That's not what that means. It means that you're marked. It's more like what you would see a seal on a letter. Maybe you'll get a letter from uh, Ed McMahon. Is he still alive? I don't think so. Probably still sending out letters. Probably letters from when he was alive. <laughs> um, but, you know, they'll, they'll try to make it fancy and seem official. They'll put one of those fake little gold seal things on the envelope and you think, oh, this must be important. Um, that's the kind of seal that we're talking about, something that marks something. And, and particularly in this case, it marks ownership. So when, when the Bible says the Holy Spirit is, is a seal that's, that's guaranteeing all that is to come, what it's saying is that it's a mark. It marks us. So if you are a Christian, what is the thing that marks you as a Christian? You have the Holy Spirit. Right? This thing that we're talking about today. If you have that mark that it means that you have this thing placed in, in, inside of your soul by God, the, the Heavenly Father, to the end of the age. And this thing that ha He has done is the very means by which you can have a relationship, a real, honest-to-goodness, interactive relationship with God that entails you hearing the voice of the Shepherd, the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit is so important. Do we, can we see that today? You know, if, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. It comes down to being that simple. If you're, if you're someone who isn't sealed by the Holy Spirit, then, then you're not marked as one of God's. If you're, if you're a person who can't find a way to relate to God, and it seems God seems like, you know, something that doesn't make sense or is utterly <laughs> mysterious to you, um, the only reason that can possibly be so is that there is there's an issue with whether or not the Holy Spirit's inside you. If the Holy Spirit is inside of you, the Holy Spirit inside of you is the very thing that makes that kind of stuff understandable. Right? And so, you know, if a person is, is struggling in all of those ways, then the, then the remedy for that is bow your heart, look to Jesus in faith, Put your life into his hands. Trust what he did on the cross for you. Trust it because he rose from the dead and he's coming back to get you. Put yourself firmly in the hands of Jesus. Uh, make yourself in, in, in your own estimation and in the dedication of your heart a follower of Christ. And if you are, then the Holy Spirit will be placed inside of you. And all of what we've been talking about will be yours as well as it is anyone else who has done the same thing. If you have the Holy Spirit, but you just really haven't been giving it the kind of attention or the kind of treating it with the kind of import that it really deserves, he really deserves, then, then let today just be something that encourages you 
to kind of reevaluate what kind of person that you are. Uh, are you a person who is ignoring the gift, the greatest gift that anyone could ever get? Are you ignoring the gift? I mean, think about it. Could God give you a million bucks? Yeah, he could. And what would you do after the million bucks were gone? What if God could give you himself in his everlasting glory? When, did, when would that gift run out? It would never run out. God gives us himself. That's what the Holy Spirit is. God gives us himself. It's the best gift that anyone could give us. And it's not something that we should ever ignore. It's not something that we should ever uh, put into a, a place in our hearts and minds as if it's something that, that is disposable, something that, that we can do without. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit so badly. We need the Holy Spirit doing what the Holy Spirit does in as full a way as possible in our lives. Or else we'll be left to our own devices. And i got to tell you, that, that doesn't have a future. Being left to your own device doesn't have a future. So what can we do about that today? Well, let's just think about what the Holy Spirit really means uh, to us. The Holy Spirit means this. The Holy Spirit means us hearing Jesus, even though we're in an age when he's in heaven and we're down here on earth. The Holy Spirit means us coming into and ascertaining truth during this confusing age of darkness. The Holy Spirit means us doing the works of Jesus and moving in those things as He is. That's one of the things that's, that's said in some of the, the verses between our readings today. Jesus says, the works I do, you will do because I go to the Father and send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit means us being able to do the works of Jesus. The Holy Spirit means us experiencing relationship with Jesus and walking with Him. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't do that. The Holy Spirit means everything. And, you know, we just need to start living faithful lives as if that's so. Maybe we need to rearrange things in our thinking. Maybe we need to shuffle our values and our priorities. Maybe we just need to not be afraid of something that's beyond our understanding, but have the faith to humble ourselves and open ourselves to hearing from the Holy Spirit. Maybe we just need to be glad that God loved us enough to give us such an awesome gift. What's, what's your relationship with the Holy Spirit like? Is it something that's active and moving and working in your life? Or is it something that needs to be worked on? I trust today that you'll make a decision to be as much as God will empower you and help you, and He will, to become a person of the Spirit. A person living and moving and walking in the Holy Spirit because God hasn't given it to you for nothing.